1987, its secret burst violently to the surface, leaving two prominent citizens dead. State Circuit Court Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were unwinding after a long day. Vincent Sherry was a prominent judge in Biloxi. Margaret was making plans to run for mayor. An unexpected visitor came to the door and brought their perfect world to an end. Inside, the police began scouring the crime scene for clues. The killer had used a homemade silencer. They found nine spent 22 caliber shell casings from a semi-automatic pistol, as well as the bullets used to murder the sheriffs. But most striking was how well the killer had covered his tracks. He did his job well, and his mission was clear. This was a professional job. The sheriffs had been assassinated. Why had the sheriffs been murdered? Salutation, Serene Eminence here. It's a pleasure to proceed with our fourth and final installment of the Courthouse Homicides series, involving a compilation of cases for which judges or the immediate family members of judges have been executed. In fact, amidst this very month of August, 2023, a superior court judge confessed to murdering his very own wife. Please do tune in to YouTube Shorts for a brief overview and definitely stay tuned for comprehensive coverage to come. In the spirit of exposing the ominous essence of conspirative corruption, the ravishing wine that shall accompany today's judgeship execution is that of an aromatically arousing gaslighter rosé. Gaslighter is exclusively curated for those souls of whom don't allow the wool to be pulled over their eyes. Nuanced notation. Gaslighting means to manipulate via utilizing psychological tactics that insidiously incites the manipulated to question their own sanity or powers of reasoning. Foreshadowing warning. The grave style of gaslighting put into play by the conspirator of this crime is that of scapegoating which is defined as the act or practice of assigning blame or failure to another as to deflect attention or responsibility away from oneself. In accordance with content formatting for the Volatile Vocation Investigations channel, criminal justice system and courtroom violence briefings were offered. Wilt's proposed protective protocol methodology was touched upon via the previous courthouse homicides compilation. The preceding episode covered a quartet of cases, which incurred a total of eight deaths, leaving one judge, one attorney, two bailiffs, and four defendants deceased. In totality, the Courthouse Homicide series has covered approximately six cases that sorrowfully incurred a total of 13 fatalities. Two of these undue cases resulted in judges being slaughtered upon the bench or within the privacy of their very own chambers. In the initial courthouse homicides episode, Superior Court Judge Roland Barnes was shot in the cranium by escaped convict Brian Nichols in the Fulton County Courthouse. In part one of the third episode, Appellate Court Judge Fernando Ciampi was shot in the heart by disgruntled defendant Claudio Giardiello in Milan's Palace of Justice. Amidst this two-part concluding installment, we should be extending our reach outside of the courtroom quarters as we concentrate on the execution of judges and their immediate family members. Although these killings were committed off of the courthouse grounds, they are still directly correlated to the vocation of ordained judgeship. Part one of the judgeship executions installment shall solely be centered upon the sherry slaying giving proper attention to the prominent victims, that of Circuit Court Judge Vincent Sherry and City Councilwoman Margaret Sherry, the conniving conspirator, that of attorney turned mayor, Pete Halat, the clandestine roles of Dixie Mafia underworld figures, Kirksey Nix, Mike Gillich, and hitman Thomas Holcomb. Now traverse with me along this surreptitiously serpentine path 
towards the unsuspecting resolution of this intricate crime. This heinous double homicide took place on the Gulf Coast in Southern Mississippi, specifically in the state's fourth largest city, that of Biloxi. Situated directly upon the Mississippi Sound, Biloxi emerged as a leisure locale in the post-bellum period, with its casino history dating all the way back to a period in 1940. Amid this war-torn era, although technically illegal, gambling took place in a casino within the Broadwater Beach Resort. To date, Biloxi is home to eight casino resort hotels with 24-hour gambling. Over 40 years later, the establishment and development of the aforementioned form of entertainment, including strip clubs and beyond, served to threaten the small town charms of the city. Tunica, Philadelphia, and Biloxi have all reaped the economic benefits of casinos, especially in the first decade after legalization. Gambling in Mississippi became a billion dollar industry and returned hundreds of millions to the state's general fund in tax revenue. The state gets 8% of every dollar, while casino localities get 4%. A few years ago, the State Council on Compulsive Gambling commissioned a study. Among the findings, Mississippi has one of the highest rates of compulsive gambling in the country with nearly 25,000 problem gamblers. They come from every age group and walk of life, and they have much higher rates of bankruptcy, divorce, and suicide. People I knew uh, um, you know, lost their jobs, lost their families, things like that. Not in any great numbers, but yes, it happened. All the credit cards will end up being maxed out. Any amount of money that was in the bank, whether it's a college fund, a retirement fund, a savings account, all that's going to be gone. This disordered gambling has the most financially devastating impact on people uh, of, any, of any, any kind of addiction. Unfortunate victim Biloxi City Councilwoman Margaret Sherry was privy to the burgeoning illegal and behind the scenes gambling happening along the seedy yet aptly named strip and she openly disclosed her mission to expose the purported involvement of select elected officials and consequently underworld kingpins and the city's corrupt criminal element. Although unequivocally commendable in her efforts, conspicuously uncovering undercover operations served to make her a prime target to all of whom silently benefited from the concealed corruption, including that of elected officials and menacing mafiosos alike. In terms of safety, it's of the utmost importance to proceed with caution, whilst operating stealthily in silence, discussing findings offline with discretion, and only engage in a full-on exposition of the sinister shadow realm once irrefutable evidence has officially been secured so that sinister souls may be unsuspectingly reprimanded via the proper channels. If the exposition transpires prematurely for all to hear and see, the exposer is liable to become a casualty of the mission very much so sooner than desirably later. In direct relation to the date, September 14, 1987, commenced as any ordinary day with Vincent Sherry attending circuit court in the morning and Margaret Sherry coordinating a meeting of the United Daughters of the Confederacy for which she would be chairing. As evening approached, the normalcy in the air shifted to eeriness. Margaret reportedly spoke on the phone about ongoing scandals in city government and how she planned to expose them. She told city council member Diane Horinsky that she was working with the FBI and had enough evidence to put Biloxi Mayor Gerald Blessy on trial. She planned to expose her findings at the next day's city council meeting at which the city's new budget was to be adopted. She was never afforded that chance. As sometime after 7 p.m., the judge and his wife were systematically slain in their ranch style four-bedroom home, 
specifically situated at 203 Hickory Hill Circle. As supported by witness testimony, subsequent to a yellow Ford Fairmont pulling up to the Sherry's home, the judge arose to answer the door and was met with several shots from a silenced 22 caliber Ruger automatic. The councilwoman attempted to arise from bed to investigate the nature of the commotion, yet did not get far as she too was swiftly shot down and left to perish in her bedroom. The silhouette of the assassin vanished into the shadows of the night. The gruesome reality of the matter wouldn't arise and shine for nearly two days, wherein it wasn't until September 16th at approximately 11 a.m. that the lifeless bodies of the Sherrys were officially discovered. In solidifying a synopsis of the slain victims, Vincent Jerome Sherry Jr. and Margaret Smith had been college sweethearts at Bowling Green State University in Kentucky amid the late 1940s. Married in 1952, Vincent and Margaret Sherry were Biloxi's version of the odd couple. They traveled in morally opposite universes. Margaret was the unrelenting, uncompromising foe of corruption and vice. Vince, however, thrived and prospered on both corruption and vice alike. Many of his clients, some of whom had wealth and clout in the local business as well as political community, were either known or rumored members of the shadowy underworld, loosely referred to as that of the Dixie Mafia. Vince operated comfortably in the society of these individuals, along with his law partner, Pete Halat. Circuit Court Judge Vincent Jerome Sherry Jr. was born in Brooklyn Kings County, New York. He was birthed a little under a week before Valentine's Day on February 10th, 1929, and of course perished on September 14th, 1987 at the age of 58. He was ultimately buried alongside his wife at Southern Memorial Park. Judge Sherry served in the United States Air Force from November 1951 until November 1971. Colonel Sherry was an intelligence officer working in association with the Pentagon for seven years and a judge advocate for 13 years. Whilst working with the United States Air Force, he was simultaneously working on his law degree, which was earned at the Georgia Washington University Law School. In 1986, Vincent was officially appointed by Mississippi Governor William A. Allain to serve as interim second circuit court judge. Almost immediately, his calendar filled up with clients who were known to move in the seedy circles centering around the strip. He found himself defending strippers, gamblers, and all other manner of shady characters inhabiting Biloxi's furtive underworld. He even brought some of his clients to his home for dinner. With the aforementioned in mind, we can clearly see that Judge Sherry's inherently corrupt vocational connections left just as many open portals for the underworld to infiltrate as that of counterpart and councilwoman Margaret Sherry, which firmly propped him up as a prime target for an insidiously illicit executed hit as well. Councilwoman Margaret Joyce Smith Sherry was born in Mooringsport, Cato Parish amid the most hot and humid month in Louisiana on July 10th, 1929. She of course perished on September 14th, 1987 at the same age as her husband, that of 58. Margaret earned a dual degree in mathematics as well as art and later went to work for an architect in Washington, D.C. Margaret Smith Sherry was active in politics on the coast. She was elected to the Biloxi City Council from Ward 7 in 1981 and served as District 5 representative to the Harrison County Republican Executive Committee. As the only Republican on the Democratic-dominated seven-member city council, she was very often a minority voting bloc of one. Stubbornly maintaining her bedrock conservative principles, she frequently found herself on the losing end of six to one votes. In 1985, 
Margaret gave up her seat on the city council to run for mayor in 1989 with the hopes of infusing her conservative principles into the infrastructure of Biloxi via ridding the city of gambling and strip clubs. Ultimately, however, she lost against her bitter political enemy, incumbent mayor Gerald Blessy, by about 500 votes. Although Mississippi is a notoriously conservative state, Blessy was one of the most liberal of elected officials. As a private citizen, Margaret regularly showed up at council meetings to voice opposition to the current mayor's policies and organized voter referenda to block his proposals. She had even announced that she planned to run again for mayor in 1989. And with Vince's recent elevation to the circuit court, a move opposed by Blessy, she was thought to have enough clout to give her a chance of winning. With all of the bitterness betwixt Blessy and Margaret, and the very real possibility that she might unseat him two years hence, it certainly seemed there was a plausible motive for Blessy to want Margaret permanently removed. In terms of circumstantial and conclusive forensic evidence regarding the overarching motive, it didn't take investigators long to conclude that the double murders had been a planned hit. Robbery did not appear to have been a motive. Vince's still full wallet was found on his body and Margaret's purse containing $42 and change plus credit cards was undisturbed. Nothing of value was missing from inside the home and there were no signs of theft. In addition to the shell casings, Small pieces of foam were also found scattered around the area from which the shots had been fired. Authorities correctly surmised that the foam came from a silencer attached to the barrel of the gun, which explained why no one in the neighborhood reported hearing any shots. Investigators began piecing together other clues. Whoever did it, they theorized, must have known the Sherrys and their plans. The murders coming just before the Sherrys were scheduled to leave for Baton Rouge to visit their daughter suggested that the killer had known they were going away and wouldn't be missed for a few days, thus allowing the killer more time to make a clean getaway. And in respects to the getaway vehicle, that of the yellow Ford Fairmont, it was abandoned in an undisclosed area and located by investigators. It was noted that the tags affixed to the vehicle were not registered to the car. The license plate was actually stolen three years before these murders occurred from another abandoned car and were utilized in 1987 to further throw investigators off kilter. And following the tracks of the stolen tags, the original abandoned car was left at an apartment complex. And in speaking to the apartment manager, it was stated that prior to having the vehicle towed, he had it stripped for parts by Biloxi Locksmith and Dixie Mafia associate Lenny Sweatman. With this Mafia connection being established, it was time to explore how all the players made their mark on the murders. Ultimately, a complex web connecting organized crime figures, elected officials, as well as connected businessmen would be unraveled. Now let's uncork the conspiracy of silence, unassumingly streaming through the collusion of the culprits. Pete Ouellette seemingly had it all. As a child, he was one of Biloxi's rising stars. As an adult, he started a successful law practice with his friend Vincent Sherry, and he later became the city's mayor. But in September 1987, Ouellette's world started to crack. Somebody executed Vincent and Margaret Sherry, and by 1991, fingers were being pointed at Hallette. Six years later, Hallette was a defendant in a conspiracy case linked to the Sherry murders. July 17, 1997, Pete Hallette arrives at the federal courthouse in Hattiesburg surrounded by family and friends. He left court that day in handcuffs surrounded by U.S. Marshals. The former Biloxi mayor would forever be known as a convicted felon. It's pretty devastating, you know. It, um, it's not something that I would uh, like to see anybody go through. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have to retract that statement. It, it, there's a couple of people I wouldn't mind see going through that, but I wouldn't like to see any good people go through it. Fifteen years, nine months, and one week later, Hallette returns to Biloxi. The handcuffs are gone. His family is back by his side. 
but everywhere he goes, he's haunted by that 1997 conviction. Peter J. Halat Jr. was born in the heart of summer on July 27th of 1942. He is an American politician and lawyer who served as the 12th mayor of Biloxi, Mississippi from 1989 to 1993. Peter Halat and Vincent Sherry became law partners in 1981, which was five years before Vincent became circuit court judge, wherein the judge would be ultimately murdered six years after their legal partnership commenced. Calls to the Sherry's home went unanswered. In relation to Halat's involvement in the discovery of the Sherry's deceased bodies, when Vince and Margaret hadn't been seen or heard from in a few days, those closest to them began to wonder. Halat proceeded to call the Sherry's and leave a message inquiring about the judge's well-being. With no response, he encouraged his law associate, Chuck, to accompany him in further investigating the circumstances regarding the judge's absence. Whilst driving towards 203 Hickory Hill Circle, Chuck attempted to engage Halat in conversation. However, he appeared to be mentally distracted and despondent. After noting that both Vince's and Margaret's cars were in the driveway and that the dogs were barking inside of the home, Halat decided to enter through the unlocked front door where he stumbled across the judge's lifeless body. Walking back towards the entrance of the dwelling, he informed Chuck that both of the Sherry's lay motionless in their residence. In hindsight, Halat was not inside of the Sherry's residence long enough to explore the bedroom where Margaret Sherry's body rested. And thus, the fact that he was privy to information regarding the crime scene without examining it in its entirety confirmed that he knew more than he was letting on. Also, Halat made the call to the Sherry's and drove to their dwelling as a means by which to further play into the role of the genuinely concerned co-worker. In fact, being present at the scene of the crime and feigning concern is a popular ploy among that of perpetrators. It is a method that interweaves the perception of innocence into the greater narrative. And situating oneself to be the one of whom discovered the bodies is an implicit power play. It superficially props him up into the position of being an instrument of resolve. Yet conversely and inherently inconspicuously, the perpetrator receives gratification from the art of deceiving and distracting others from the reality of his unseen scheme. In terms of Halat's conclusive motive, Halat had stolen hundreds of thousands of dollars from former Dixie Mafia leader and co-conspirator Kirksey Nix to cover financial difficulties and blamed the loss of the money on Judge Sherry. Kirksey Nix believed Halat's claim and ordered the deaths of Judge Sherry and his wife. Thomas Holcomb was subsequently hired by Nix to murder the couple in their home. Halat was later charged for his involvement in the criminal conspiracy, which led to the deaths of the Sherrys. He was found guilty on four counts and acquitted on the murder count. He was ultimately sentenced to 18 years in prison, of which he served 15 years, nine months, and one week. He vehemently denied his involvement in the conspiracy to murder the Sherrys, through to the conclusion of his prison sentence, engaging in a widely broadcasted interview during May 2013 clarifying the true nature of his convictions. The biggest issue he mentioned several times was the jury's finding that he had no role in the murders of Vincent and Margaret Sherry. I was acquitted in count two of the indictment, which charged the substantive crime of murder. But people still report that I was convicted in connection with the murders of Vince and Margaret Sherry, he said. 
the jury found him guilty on the following counts for which he was convicted. Conspiracy to commit wire fraud, obstruction of justice, conspiracy to commit obstruction of justice, and conspiracy to violate the racketeering statute. Were you involved in any way with the plot to kill Vincent and Margaret Cherry? Again, there's, there's not a word in the English language strong enough to couch my denial in for that. I had absolutely nothing to do with that. Absolutely nothing. And had I had anything, had I known anything about it, if I would have known anything about it, I would have done everything in my power to prevent it. You've always maintained your innocence. Still do. And you've said an innocent man has nothing to fear. Do you still believe in that statement? And do you still believe in the justice system? Well, I, I believe in that statement to the extent that I have nothing to fear when I'm done here on earth. You know, when, when my life is over with and I have to face this issue before God, I have absolutely no fear whatsoever. None. I mean, there are still people who believe that they have heard on television that I was convicted of conspiracy to murder the Sherrys. And that's absolutely not true. I was not convicted of conspiracy to murder the Sherrys. Pedalette was convicted on four charges related to a Louisiana prison scam. And for those illegal acts, Hallett spent nearly 16 years in federal custody. You sound angry and you still sound bitter. Are, are you all these years later? <laughs> I sound angry and I sound what? Bitter. Oh, bitter? Well, for someone to do to me what some of these people did to me, to say some of the things about me, to call me a coward, to say that my cowardice caused my friend to be killed, to say that I wanted my friend to be killed because of missing money, I don't think that I could ever not be bitter in an instance like that. But any bitterness the former Biloxi mayor may harbor is offset by a feeling of tremendous relief. Hallett is back in Biloxi, and he's surrounded by the people who love him most. The higher the perceived role, the deeper the actual truth is shrouded. Beings in high places routinely utilize scapegoats to blame their dubious deeds on so that the falsehood of their coveted character may be continually upheld in the eyes of the public. This type of entity would never dare admit guilt and shall maintain his innocence until his dying day, as to maintain a sense of control over his projected narrative. Although the jury deemed him not guilty, thus causing for his murder indictment to be acquitted, this judiciary result alone does not unequivocally prove his innocence. It simply is a testament to the fact that there was simply not enough substantial evidence presented to prove without a shadow of a doubt that he did indeed play a pivotal role in the conspiratorial murder of the Sherrys. Covert narcissists such as Peter Halat Jr. run rampant in positions of power and intentionally hold strong to their stance, which serves as a support system to their lies, such that their conviction and charisma convinces the masses that they are indeed who they say they are, when they are undeniably not. In respects to the Halat, Sherry, and Dixie Mafia connection, crooked clients in need of criminal defense who had the most money whose gain had been ill-gotten through vice and corruption were in fact the kinds of clients for which the Halat and Sherry law firm had knowingly operated in accordance with. In fact, the mastermind behind this con game was client and convicted murderer Kirksey McCord Nix Jr., of whom was a Dixie mafioso that was imprisoned at Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola, and the primary receiver of the ill-gotten monies involved in the con was that of the Biloxi law firm of Halat and Sherry. For the nuanced sake of clarification and contextualization, 
One of the ways Judge Sherry earned his money was by being on the receiving end of the money Nix was raking in on his lonely heart scam. Nix was represented by Halat and was operating the scam from Angola prison so that he could raise money to buy his way out of a life sentence, wherein thousands of dollars were being accrued in a scheme that tied together an intricate network of convicts, complicit prison guards, runners, and other individuals on the outside of the prison, including the receivers of the money who were laundering it through rapidly swelling bank accounts. Towards the end of the lifespan of the scam, a large chunk of the money Nix had been laundering via the Lonely Heart scam through to the Halat and Sherry firm turned up missing, about $500,000 worth, though later sources put that amount closer to $200,000. Subsequent to catching wind of the missing monies, a meeting was held at Angola betwixt Nix and Halat, as well as several other Dixie Mafia inmates, including Bobby Joe Fabian, of whom provided investigators with insider information regarding the meeting. It was stated that when Nix asked Halat about the missing money, Halat, the man of whom had delivered the eulogy at the Sherry's funeral, denied any responsibility and blamed it on Vince Sherry. According to Fabian, a hit was then ordered on the judge and a career killer named John Ransom was contracted to do the dirty work. Breaking down crucial breaks in the case. In the summer of 1989, now two years after the murders, Captain Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Office, who had been recently assigned to take over the Sherry murder investigation, recalled a statement recorded by Halat Jr.'s law partner, Chuck, mentioning that he had directly interacted with Ransom outside of the law office, wherein Ransom inquired as to where Judge Vince Sherry's office was located. Upon investigating Ransom's whereabouts, he received word from authorities in Georgia that a man by the name of John Ransom and another accomplice had been arrested on a murder charge. The weapon used in this murder was similar to the one used on the Sherry's. With Ransom safely in custody, Cook ordered a search of his house. What was found were silencers, a roll of foam of the type normally used in silencers, and a phony stock certificate from a scam Ransom and Nix concocted, drawn up by the Halat and Sherry firm. During the prosecutorial portion of the trial, the government's final witness, another accomplice named William Bill Rhodes, told the court he had been offered $30,000 by Halat and Ransom to drive the getaway car in the Sherry hit. Ransom had said a judge would be murdered and that the pay was $10,000. Even more damning to Halat, even though he hadn't been charged with anything yet, was a statement Halat allegedly made when Rhodes had suggested sparing Margaret's life, which was, no, she's got to die. We're under investigation. She's the weak link. She knows his business. She's got to go too. Rhodes said he also met with Mike Gillich, the Biloxi strip club owner, who would supply the money once the hit was done. But five months later, before they could do the job, Rhodes was arrested on an unrelated bank robbery charge. And Ransom got cold feet, afraid Rhodes would turn on him. In light of these incriminating insights, the prosecution kept strong to their strategy of proving that a conspiracy existed, a conspiracy involving big money and the motive for murder when that money went astray. Since large sums of money had been reported missing, someone would have to take the fall for crossing a dangerous man like Kirksey Nix. Neither Mike Gillich, of whom was a former Biloxi striptease lounge owner who helped plot the murders, nor Halat had wanted to take the fall. And thus, Halat implicitly implicated Vince Sherry. The whistleblower reveals the actual killer. In the case of Mike Gillich, the once formidable Dixie Don was facing the possibility of spending the rest of his life in jail as an additional charge of witness bribery and witness tampering was about to be tacked on to his sentence. Gillich was in no hurry to accrue more jail time. Bell's relentless pressure had persuaded him to cut a deal before the bribery trial even began. 
the Dixie Mafia member would tell what he knew about the murders. With this being the case, the Dixie Don was more than ready to sing the tune many had been waiting nearly a decade to hear. He was ready to pinpoint the murderer in exchange for a clemency deal, of course. But for a career criminal like Mike Gillich, adjusting to life on the right side of the law wasn't easy. At first, he tried to bluff his way out. When deception didn't work, Gillich had no alternative. He had to tell the truth. Now, for the first time, Bell heard the story from an inside source. Gillich knew all the details. During interviews conducted by the FBI, he finally revealed who pulled the trigger on the Sherrys. The actual killer was a shadowy Dixie Mafia hitman who had flown completely under investigators' radar for nearly nine years an ex-con and part-time carnival worker from Texas named Thomas Leslie Holcomb. Holcomb would be paid $20,000 to murder Judge Sherry and his wife. The driver of the getaway car, Gillich said, was an ex-cop named Glenn Cook. Most damning of all, Mike Gillich also directly implicated Pete Halat. To prove his story about Holcomb, Gillich brought investigators to an old house where he said Holcomb had test fired the 22 caliber gun. Closer investigation revealed bullet holes in the floor right where Mike Gillich had said the shots were fired. Holcomb was located, arrested, and charged with the murders. In October of 1996, agents arrested hitman Thomas Holcomb in Texas on murder charges. Now let's disclose incriminating concluding clues in tandem with subsequent indictments. It was time to confront Mayor Halat. It would be a quiet warning, man to man. And I let Mayor Halat know that I thought his knowledge of the Sherry murders was much greater than uh, what he had shared with law enforcement authorities up to that point. And I recall also telling him that the FBI would continue working on this case until it was totally solved. The noose was now tightening around Pete Halat's neck with Mr. Mike Gillich hauling the hanging rope. Mike described the fatal Angola meeting at which Nix and Halat had been present and asserted that Halat did in fact implicate Vince as the one responsible for the missing money. Soon after that, according to Mike's account, Halat returned to Biloxi, closed his office's safe deposit box, opened a new one with Vince's name on it with a number similar to that of the previous box. This, Halat apparently hoped, would link Vince to the theft of the money in Nix's eyes. With this new insider information, it was enough for the prosecutors to proceed. Nearly a decade later, Halat was indicted on October 23rd, 1996, regarding all conspiratorial charges besides murder. Nix and Holcomb were charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Of course, Halat, now a former mayor, ferociously denied the charges, but by this point, his credibility was completely shot. Respective to the unfurling fates of the parties involved, Pete Alat, of course, was released 15 years, nine months, and one week after serving his 18-year sentence. According to an ABC 16 2012 article, Pete Halat was reported to have been working at a church in Hattiesburg, engaging in responsibilities such as painting, doing yard work, and performing any other requested chores. Thomas Holcomb died in a prison in Beaumont, Texas, while serving a life sentence on April 8, 2005. John Ransom was released from federal prison in Georgia on November 7, 2003. Mike Gillich was released from prison in July 2000 after serving nine years of his sentence. Kirk C. Nix was moved to a federal prison in Florence, Colorado. He continues to appeal his convictions, but the appeals to date have proven to be exercises in futility. 
The missing money that led to the deaths of Vincent and Margaret Sherry has indeed never been accounted for. In summation, the entire Sherry murder case, in fact, reads like a movie. Akin to the 1990 Patrick Swayze movie, Ghost, which eerily hit theaters while the Sherry case was unfolding, had a similar plot. Swayze, also known as Sam, is murdered by friend and corrupt business partner, Carl, over a shady business deal. Sam was simply getting too close to discovering a conspiracy involving large sums of ill-gotten money. And the potentiality of this unveiling left Sam stranded in the shadow realm, powerless yet intent on protecting his one true love. Stay tuned for part two of the Judgeship Execution installment, wherein I shall be providing a thorough explication on pathways to judgeship, as well as cover cases related to judges of whom were conspiratorially executed or had their immediate family members murdered, respective to their ordained roles as a judge. In the meantime, turn all post notifications on so that you may stay abreast on case updates as well as supplementary true crime content via community posts, YouTube shorts, as well as the vocational volatility Instagram. I recently posted excerpts from an exclusive interview conducted with Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, of whom touched upon the evils of governmental bodies as well as his views on Satanism. And with all that being said, I thank you kindly for tuning in with me, beautifully beloved beings. And until next time, you all stay safe, stay stealthy, and stay serene. Pete Halat was indeed behind the plan to murder the Sherrys. The plot grew directly out of the Lonely Heart scam of Angola prison inmate Kirksey Nix. It is not known who ordered Margaret's death, but as a fierce opponent of corruption, she posed a threat to the underworld forces hoping to control Biloxi. With Margaret dead, Halat could be free to run the town. Some months before the Sherry's deaths, Halat had closed the safe deposit box. He then transferred the money into a box only he and Judge Sherry could use. Motivated by greed, he stole $100,000 cash from there. As Nix's trusted accomplice, Halat could blame the theft on Judge Sherry. Next, he went to Mike Gillich with news of the theft. Gillich said that he and Halat planned the murders. Ransom and Rhodes provided the murder weapon, but when they passed on doing the hit, Gillich found a replacement, a Texas-based petty criminal named Thomas Holcomb. Holcomb would be paid $20,000 to murder Judge Sherry and his wife. 